evening. This happened recently in a North Philadelphia neighborhood. A white neighborhood which suddenly found itself with a stranger in its midst. A Negro who tried to occupy this house. This was the result. One of the most delicate and dangerous problems in human relations faced by the community as a whole. Tonight we will explore, as thoroughly as our time allows, the problem of what is called racial integration in housing. The violent reaction you just saw, fortunately, was rare. The basic situation is not. The Philadelphia Housing Association recently reported that 88% of all Philadelphia Negro families and 22% of all Philadelphia white families live in blocks in which there is some racial integration, mixed housing. In the overwhelming majority of cases, the adjustment is a peaceful one, if not exactly a happy one. All available information, however, indicates that this integration will increase. The community is changing. And how will we meet the challenge? We are vaguely aware that this change is taking place. But few of us have any definite awareness as to why. Perhaps one of the men best qualified to answer this question is Mr. George Shermer, director of Philadelphia's Commission on Human Relations. Change in our American cities is nothing new. The only thing that is new is that the characters are different. All through America's history, people have been migrating from other parts of the world to the United States. And most of us can recall the years when steady streams of migrants came here from Europe. Most of them poor, most of them unskilled, most of them looking for a better way of life. All of them settling in the poorer, older sections of our city. Their children went to school, learned skills, learned the language, got better jobs, wanted to improve themselves, moved to new neighborhoods. And our city neighborhoods were constantly in a process of change. Today, most of our European migration is um, shut off. And the migration that is coming into the city comes from the rural areas. The largest reservoir of such population is in the south. People there, white and Negro, are moving off of the farms and into our cities into Philadelphia are coming large numbers of Negroes seeking jobs, seeking to improve their way of life, a better way of life for their children. A better way of life carries with it the demand for a better place to live. The picture is steadily improving, but about 17% of all Philadelphia Negro families are still occupying dilapidated dwellings. In a word, slums. And here is born the driving need for a change, for improvement, for a decent place to live. Change. How do people act or react? If you fight, more run. A lot of them stay. By fight, I mean physical violence, mob action. It happens in various parts of our country. It doesn't happen very much in Philadelphia, fortunately. By one, I mean people in panic, listing their property for sale, selling for almost any price, and moving away. By staying, I mean people who get together, meet their new neighbors, make friends, and decide that they're going to make a good community of it, whether people of different colors live there or not. One of the neighborhoods in which this change has been accomplished with a minimum of bitterness is tree-shaded East Johnson Street in Germantown. This is frankly a mixed block, and according to Mrs. Jane Wilhelm of 202 East Johnson, the change in itself need hold no terror. Well, um, you moved into this neighborhood when? In April, like two years ago. And uh, you were aware at that time that the so-called change was already taking place. Yes, we knew that uh, there were uh, Negro families living in the block below uh, this block, but we wanted to live here uh, in this neighborhood and particularly in this house. Now, when you first moved in, the neighborhood was predominantly white. Is that right? Yes, it was. Um, since that time, I assume that a good many of your neighbors have left. Yes, 
uh, across the street, all of them have left, and uh, we have new neighbors on both sides of us, too. Uh, one of them is colored, and the other is white. Uh, across the street, they're all Negroes. What were some of the fears voiced by your white neighbors who moved away? Uh, chiefly, they were afraid of the property values. They, uh, uh, first off, they wanted to be sure they, that the, they got all the money that they could out of their uh, property. Uh, they thought that the property would depreciate the minute that the Negroes moved in. Has this been the case? This has been absolutely the reverse of the truth, uh, because our new Negro neighbors have uh, improved their properties. Uh, every single house has been in large measure repaired and fixed it up and, and really beautified. The, the whole appearance of the neighborhood is lovely now. Uh, were there any problems of adjustment in a newly changed mixed neighborhood? Well, uh, in any kind of uh, situation where new people move into a neighborhood, there is getting to know people. And our, our present neighbors, are, uh, we had to get to know them, too, uh, learn how they uh, manage their children, how they, whether they were interested in the community activities, uh, such as our neighborhood organization, and, uh, uh, oh, whether they were aware of the need to uh, uh, cooperate. Uh, How about the children? Have they had any trouble adjusting to their new neighbors? As, as far as I can tell, none at all. They, the children have played together uh, as children do uh, mm -hmm. with no um, consideration of the fact that, there is, that it's a mixed group of children. Down the street at 272 East Johnson, we then talk to Mrs. Theodore Perkins, one of the newcomers. Mrs. Perkins, when did you and your husband move to Johnson Street? About two and a half years About ago. About two and a half years ago. Where have you been living before that? We have been living on 47th Street. 47th Street? Yes. You were among the first of the Negro families to move to Johnson Street, were you not? Yes, we were. How many have preceded you? Two families. What difficulties have they had? I would say that their difficulties were minor, but they did have some, uh, such as instances where a window might be broken or trash burning. In other words, vandalism. Yes. But still overt acts of hostility. Yes. What problems have arisen from your experience in living in a so-called mixed neighborhood? Well, I think when... Any Negro family moves to a mixed community, there is a problem of whether or not you're going to be accepted. And you do want to live together harmoniously. And uh, I think that that was the greatest problem, making friends and getting white families to accept us just as they would another white family. In May of 1953, they formed an organization called the Johnson Street Neighbors, which is all the name implies. Its purpose was for all people, all neighbors, to join in protecting the standards of the neighborhood. They met this night in Mrs. Wilhelm's home. And as things go in the summer, attendance was slim. This night, they were discussing a common danger arising from an attempt to drop the building standards for several vacant lots in the neighborhood. They decided to hold a bazaar to raise money for their zoning fight. And the discussion was spirited and free. These are the Johnson Street Neighbors in action. Negro moves into a neighborhood, property values automatically decrease almost overnight. Now, in your experience, is this true? Many factors affect property values, so we can't give any categorical answer to that question. We can say this, that if people get panicky, and many of them list their property for sale all at once, so that there is more property for sale than there are buyers, then property values are bound to decline. The normal picture, as we see it, is that if people don't get panicky, or if after they have overcome their panic, many of them take their property off the market, so 
so that only a normal amount of property is for sale at any given time. The property values hold their own very well. I believe that's been supported by research and the subject in other cities. We haven't done any research uh, along that line in Philadelphia. Another fear, more often whispered than voiced, is that the stereotyped Negro has far lower social standards and that the social values of the neighborhood will decrease with property values. What about that? Well, we're all aware that social standards conform pretty much to education and income. And where we have families that are very poor, living under crowded circumstances in the slums, slums that we're familiar with here in Philadelphia, we see low personal standards as well. But in the neighborhoods where Negroes are buying property today, most of them fairly decent, though perhaps rather old neighborhoods, uh, the families that are buying there have a background of education, they have an income, uh, they move in and seem to conform very well to the general standard of the people in the community. In a few instances, we've seen communities improve as Negroes have moved in. Statistics sometimes have a way of defeating a story. For example, almost 33,500 Negro families still live in substandard homes in Philadelphia. But only the homes are substandard, not the hopes. You have heard it said, Nobody has to live like that. But that cry usually comes from members of the great white majority. We refuse to call any human being typical. But perhaps Mr. and Mrs. Henry Hall of North 6th Street are at least representative. And here's what they are doing about it. Well, the problem we have now about this is the problem we have now on 2218 and a half North 6th Street. Now, the problem is he doesn't pay much every week, just $10 a week. But the condition of the place of heating and hot water, uh, to me, is something terrible. Like uh, my wife said that we have two small children. Every time we have to heat water to give children a bath, or we have to go down there and ask the man uh, when he's going to make some hot water, and he said it's no wood, and different situations like that. So, in fact, and as far as the cleanest is concerned around this block, I mean, to me, I think it's, it's terrible. There really should be something done more than what's been done now. As far as buying a home is concerned, majority of the real estate offices that I've gone to, well, they figure I can't get an apartment on account of the children and the high rent. And they're mentioned about buying a home. Well, some of the homes are nice and some of them aren't. And the down payment they want for the, ni uh, for the nice ones or just out of reason. And you go to look at the other ones, they say $100 down, $200 down. They're not worth buying. And then the bad location, and I wouldn't want to bring up my children in those locations. And the, uh, I would like to buy a home in the suburbs. But so far, I haven't been able to get out that far because my husband doesn't make enough money for me to reach that far. So I just have to take what I can uh, get around here, but it doesn't suit me. But when you can't do any better, you have to take what comes to you, but... Shermer, if a Negro couple makes the decision to be the first Negro couple to move into a white neighborhood, what can they expect? What's the treatment? Well, in a few instances, they'll meet with open hostility. Uh, there may be demonstrations of violence. Fortunately, that it doesn't occur very often. Sometimes they'll meet with real friendship. That happens, too, and with increasing frequency. But most often, I think, uh, they just meet with a sort of a cold process of ignoring them, uh, maybe a kind of forced politeness, something that goes very slowly in the way of developing real acquaintanceship and real friendship. On Salem Street in Philadelphia's Frankfurt section, Mr. and Mrs. Clarence McCoy and their small son were the first Negroes to move into the neighborhood. And their experience was by far the most common one. They were greeted by coldness, in some cases open hostility, but no overt acts of any kind. The only friends the McCoys have made in their new surroundings are their next door neighbors, Mr. and Mrs. Frank Thomas, who have three children of their own. Both couples have discovered that they can talk over their differences with surprising frankness. So I guess everybody sort of uh, got excited 
I said, I have them move in. And, uh, but now that you're here and you're nice and all, I think the people sort of will just, you know, take to you, just like I did. I, I realize that takes a long time because uh, sometimes people don't understand until they really get to know you. I mean, of course, as my husband said, you boys live in white neighborhoods, and there, well, they warm up a little quicker. Where some people do warm up much quicker, and they will speak to you readily, you know, right away. And others just take them longer to get more friendly with you because I don't know just the way some people are. I hope. Uh, I hope you don't feel funny. Uh, because I don't feel a porch mark, and I thought maybe the reason you thought that I could feel a porch mark because you live living here. But that's not the reason. I haven't found a porch mark before, even you, before you moved in. I uh, usually stay in a good bit. Well, no, Regina, I don't feel that way at all because, as I say, when you have a house and a play to do, and I stay pretty busy with my little son, I don't have too much time to sit on the porch myself. <laughs> So, well, I thought maybe, you know, you felt as if I wasn't sitting out there because you were living here. Mm -hmm. That thought has never entered my mind because if I try to, I don't have a one-track mind anyway. <laughs> mm -hmm. I don't feel that way. I'm not thinking of anything like that about anybody. But I feel as if you want to sit on your porch that you're privileged to sit at any time you desire. Well, I think in fact to, to the point of situation to explain myself more thoroughly, is that it hasn't been any trouble with the neighbors at all, just that they haven't warmed up to us. And that's my, my reason for saying the situation. I hope this is verified by everybody listening in. Between 1940 and 1950, home ownership among Philadelphia Negroes increased a staggering 340%. And this fact offers new impetus to the hopes of others. For example, Mr. and Mrs. James Bagwell of Carpenter Street. They have five children. It costs them $65 a month to carry the home that they rent while they wait. Mr. Fagnell, could you tell me a little bit about what types of homes you've had since you came back from the war? Well, I lived in a two-room apartment uh, just after I came back from the war, and uh, we uh, had three children. And uh, we needed more room, so uh, I started looking for another place. And uh, I thought uh, this would be a good place since it had a lot of rooms. In. How many rooms does it have? It has seven rooms. Who's Bagwell? Does uh, Little Muriel here and your other four youngsters have a pretty nice place to play around here? Yeah, no, they don't. Are there any playgrounds around here at all? Yeah, there's a couple of them. Park and playground, but it's way a distance from the house. How about out in the street here? No, they don't. I'm scared to trust them. A lot of traffic? Too much traffic, yes. You have a factory, I believe, right across the street, yes, and I guess does. that would attract a lot of trucks. Yes, it does. It's certainly not a good place for this little one to play. No, it isn't. I suppose that's one of the reasons why you'd like, if possible, to move away, get a home of your own where you'll have a place for the youngsters. Yes, it is. Have you done much looking around, Mr. Bagwell, for a place? Well, no, not since I got this place. Uh, what I want to do is buy a home instead of rent. Uh, right now, I'm not, not able to get a house right now. When and if Mr. Bagwell is able to buy a house, he will find that his choice is limited almost exclusively to second-hand homes. For in the seven years between 1946 and 1953, only 45 new homes in all of Philadelphia were offered for sale to Negroes. In light of this fact, then, it's not surprising that the work of Mr. Morris Milgram, interviewed here by Ernie Lease, is regarded as unique. Mr. Milgram, I've been told that your Concord Park development here on Old Lincoln Highway just outside Philadelphia is the only one that's open occupancy available to everyone. Is that right? That's the only one that I know of, of single homes available to all people without racial or religious discrimination. It's not housing for Negroes, it's housing for all people, and we're getting whites and Negroes who want to live side by side. 
I suppose in financing a project like this, you had some difficulty when the word got around that your homes were up for open occupancy. Uh, I was utterly amazed at the problems we ran into. Uh, there were uh, cases, for example, of insurance companies, powerful ones that expressed great interest in our developments. The moment they learned that we were planning to make homes available to all people, they closed uh, their doors. Uh, the, the problem uh, uh, is the same essentially in the New York market as it is here, although I must admit the situation is improving. The mortgage uh, buyers are getting more interested in financing open occupancy housing uh, due to uh, uh, a great deal of educational work that has been done on this matter, both by the past administration and the present one. Just how big a problem was it to get uh, somebody to finance your homes? How long did it take you, for example? It took me 17 months to find the first person who was ready to put his money alongside of mine in this development. Who that, was he? That was George Otto, a Quaker builder of Morrisville, who was the head of Penn Valley Constructors. Uh, after he put his money down, uh, we were able to get 60 others, mostly Quakers, who put up a total of $150,000 to make possible the building of this development and another one to be built later in Philadelphia. What were some of the reasons given by these financiers for not being able to go along with you and your request for money? Usually, they would evade the issue by stating that uh, they didn't like the architecture of the house or by stating that they uh, had already invested enough money in mortgages on homes occupied by Negroes and didn't feel they wanted to put any more in, uh, even though they, thought they were having no particular difficulty uh, with their Negro homeowners. Tell me, uh, did you run into the uh, question in the, in the minds of some of the financial risk of a Negro family as opposed to the white? Yes, there was a lot of discussion, but every time uh, the facts were analyzed, the bankers admitted that uh, they were having approximately the same experience with Negroes as with whites. The only exception to that was one uh, case told by a banker who said that in uh, one New Jersey community, uh, in a certain development, uh, people had sold numerous uh, appliances to the Negro home buyers, making it extremely difficult for them to meet the many time payments. Uh, but uh, some of the uh, savings bank officials said that, in general, they would say their experience with the Negro homeowners was better than with white. In fact, Tom Gallagher, the assistant director of FHA in this city, told me uh, almost two years ago that FHA had never had a foreclosure on a Negro homeowner, whereas it had had foreclosures on white homeowners. By now, you undoubtedly have noticed a conspicuous absence in this report. What we admit is an obvious weakness. Try as we might, we could find no white opponent of racial integration willing to express his or her views before our cameras. We do not deny that there are those who might be willing. We only can report that we could not find them. What is it like to suffer the constant humiliation of closed doors, of shifting eyes and lame explanations? Well, one of the most eloquent accounts comes from Mr. and Mrs. Ralph Pearson of the 5800 block on Spruce Street. Mr. and Mrs. Pearson, uh, would you tell us about the apartment that you now live in and why it's not adequate for you? Well, the main reason why it is not adequate is the fact that it is not large enough. Uh, we have one bedroom and then a small room that we're using for our daughter, age seven. The room just isn't, just isn't large enough. And we would like to move into an apartment or a house, preferably a house, where there would be enough accommodations for a family of three so that we could live without being all over each other and actually have room to relax and enjoy living. How long have you been looking for a place now? I would say we've been looking for decent housing in Philadelphia for five years. Now, we would prefer to have a house in Central City. Now, it's true that uh, any number of people are probably looking for the same thing that we are, uh, and the problem of color or race would have too much to do with that. But the problem is made doubly difficult for us simply because the places that we have found have not been available to us particularly on the basis of race. What are sort of the situations of that type that you have run into? 
Well, to give you an example, about two or three months ago, we found a lovely place that we thought would be adequate. And uh, when we approached the owner, we were told that we could not see the apartment. Uh, we were a little confused at first and couldn't understand just why we couldn't see the place. And he finally agreed to let us look at it. And believe it or not, it was just what we wanted. And then we learned that uh, this particular place was for white and Negroes uh, couldn't live there. And we were supposed to accept that and leave. That was the end of it. You also have to take into consideration the fact that you, uh, you have to know these things. I mean, everybody seems to assume that you know what neighborhood you can consider renting a house or buying a house in. And if you are new in a city, you often don't know and don't wish to find out. You simply want to be a free agent to find a neighborhood you'd like to live in and then go about it in a business like mine. Do you ever run into any real estate men who have tried to get you interested in a place that's in a completely white neighborhood? Yes, we have uh, had good experience, uh, I should say, in that sense, although uh, you're often in a position of not knowing just uh, how it's going to work out, and it's an experimental sort of thing, and it's often in a so-called changing neighborhood, and it's also often a case of old houses that they're going to rebuild to make them habitable, it's never available at the moment. And many times you're pressed to move right away, but it's certainly not an all black and white situation at all. Tell me, uh, sometimes I suppose you do run into real estate men or landlords who don't uh, turn you down because you're Negroes. They find other reasons. Well, as a matter of fact, I would like to have the experience of meeting a person who was honest enough about his convictions to say that we just don't feel that the time is right for some of the general excuses they use because you are Negroes and we don't want you to live in our neighborhood. But you never, in my experience, get that uh, particular reaction. They will tell you they've accepted deposits from other people or that it's already been rented or that it's simply not available at the moment and you can call them and at a later date. And of course, that later date never comes and you never get the call. Very difficult to explain to our daughter. Uh, we see any number of signs, apartment for rent or house for rent, and uh, she can't understand just why we can't get that place. Oh, look, Daddy, that's a beautiful place. Why can't we get that one? And uh, very difficult to explain this to a youngster, uh, especially when you're attempting to bring the child up to realize that this is a democracy, this is where we live, we want to make our contribution here. This has been the problem briefly explored. Mr. Sherman, exactly what is the climate of opinion in the community right now? Well, when you're dealing with the feelings and the behavior of a large number of human beings, you know that it's dangerous to guess, and all I can do is guess. It's our judgment that, generally speaking, the people around Philadelphia recognize that there is something inevitable and something basically right about this fact that people of all groups, regardless of their color or ancestry, must have an equal opportunity to get homes and that they're, in the process, they're going to move to all parts of the city. And that racially mixed neighborhoods is something that is just going to happen. Now, people accept that, I say, as inevitable and right. But I don't think most people like it very much. Just some people. This is Dick McCutcheon wishing you a peaceful and reflective evening.